Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for having me. So I'm going to give the uh, first in two parts of a kind of survey results on spectral graph theory. So I wanted to start by prefacing my talk and saying, uh, so this first talk will be very uh, elementary. It's designed to uh, bore the experts in the crowd. But also, if you're not so familiar with spectral graph theory, I strongly encourage you to ask questions if you get lost at any point, because we're going to hopefully be moving through some of the rudimentary objects that people look at in spectral graph theory. And the second talk will move a little bit quicker through some algorithms. So um, what do I think when I think spectral graph theory? Um, spectral graph theory gives us a way of associating continuous objects to uh, discrete properties of graphs. So we often want to look at things on graphs like cliques or connected components or matchings. Um, and it's really nice to have a continuous relaxation of these so that we can use uh, techniques from other fields. And so that's the idea of spectral graph theory. We want to associate linear algebraic objects to graphs so that we get continuous properties that relate to these discrete uh, properties we're interested in. Uh, I should note that these slides closely follow uh, lecture notes of Dan Spielman. OK, so I'm going to start with the problem of clustering. Um, so there's uh, many times where people are interested in finding balanced cuts. So a cut that has as few edges as possible in a graph, uh, but splits the graph into two pieces, which are nearly equal parts. So maybe you'd say uh, each piece has size 1 third to 2 thirds of the vertices of the graph. Uh, this is not so easy to develop an objective for. Uh, it's a little artificial. but. Uh, Maybe an easier thing to develop an objective for is looking at the ratio of the number of edges we cut over the size of the uh, subset, or the smallest subset. So let's formalize this. So uh, given a subset of the vertices of a graph, I define the boundary to be all of uh, the edges leaving the subset. Uh, then the isoparametric ratio is the ratio of the boundary, uh, the size of the boundary, to the size of the subset. And we're only interested in looking at subsets which are uh, smaller than half the size of the graph. And so for a graph, uh, if we're trying to find some, uh, some ideal way of cutting the graph into two clusters, we're going to be interested in this isoparametric number, which is the minimum of the uh, isoparametric ratio over all subsets of appropriate size. So uh, I'm going to use this graph as a toy example in my talk. Uh, in this graph, I'm looking at the subset at the moment 1, 2. Uh, the boundary, yet again, is all edges leaving my subset. Uh, so here, my boundary has size 4. Um, while oh, this is a mistake, this should be a 2, <laughs> uh, the size of my subset is 2. I'm thinking of the subset as vertices, not edges. So my isoparametric ratio here is 2. Uh, but this is not the best I can do in this graph. Uh, it's pretty clear that probably I shouldn't cut the graph here if I want to cluster it. So uh, if I look at these three vertices, which are labeled 1, 2, 6 here, um, then I see my boundary is these three edges, uh, and my isoparametric ratio here is 1. So it doesn't take uh, that long to convince yourself that for this small toy graph, this is the best we're going to get. And so this is the isoparametric, uh, isoparametric number for the graph. OK, so how do we uh, find quickly uh, a nice subset of the graph that has really low uh, isoparametric ratio? So the idea will be to associate to it, uh, to try to relate it to linear algebra. So the, there are two objects that people look at when they're looking at uh, spectral graph theory. One uh, is given a graph. We want to look at uh, the adjacency matrix of the graph. So the adjacency matrix of a graph is just formed I mean, it's the way that you, know, you could naively store this uh, as a data object. You would, uh, for every, it, so the, the vertices correspond to the rows and columns. And for every edge, you put a 1. And for the lack of edge, you put a 0. Uh, you'll notice here, I'm uh, assuming that we have some nice undirect, uh, undirected graph, weightless graph. Um, but you can do a lot of this uh, in varying capacities for different types of graphs. And then we're going to associate to this uh, also the Laplacian. The Laplacian is where we just take the uh, degrees of the vertices down the diagonal and subtract out the adjacency matrix. And we'll see why we want to do that in a second. Um, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to assume we're looking at a D regular graph. Makes uh, my life pretty easy. Makes a lot of calculations easy. But like I said, a lot of this can be done uh, 
without any kind of assumptions. So one of the nice things about looking at a undirected graph is we get a symmetric matrix. So we can apply uh, spectral theorem. We're going to get a bunch of uh, real eigenvalues, orthogonal eigenvectors, et cetera, which will allow us to see where we can go with that. So why the Laplacian? So if we treat the uh, Laplacian as a quadratic form, so now I'm thinking of these, uh, if we remember the Laplacian, the rows and the columns correspond to vertices on my graph. So I'm thinking of these vectors as being indexed by the vertices of my graph. You can think of it as giving a weight, a real weight to each vertex. Uh, if I think of this Laplacian as a quadratic form, uh, I quickly get this formula. And this formula tells us a lot of information uh, immediately. So the first thing it tells us is that the Laplacian is positive semi-definite. Um, it tells us that the null space of my Laplacian is exactly spanned by indicator uh, vectors for the subsets, uh, the connected components of my graph. And so from that, I see that the multiplicity of eigenvalues 0 is the number of con connected components of G. So when I'm looking at clustering, I'm going to want to look at a connected graph. And uh, this tells us that for the connected graph, we have this trivial eigenvalue all the time. We always have eigenvalue 0 sitting at the bottom of my spectrum. And the eigenvector there is going to be the all ones vector. So for a connected graph, the, the object of interest is going to be lambda 2. Lambda 1 is always 0. Lambda 2 is the first non-trivial eigenvalue. Um, sitting above that. OK, so what's the connection? What's the connection between the isoparametric ratio and the um, Laplacian? So we look at Rayleigh quotients. Um, as a reminder, uh, Rayleigh quotients can be used to obtain the uh, eigenvalues of a graph by uh, restricting to the eigenspaces, uh, restricting away from the eigenspaces below you. So we have uh, the first eigenspace uh, was spanned by the all ones vector. So if I look at the perp of the all ones vector and I look at my Rayleigh quotients, then Caron Fisher says minimizing over those gives us lambda 2. So we should think of the Rayleigh quotients as some way to uh, approximate the second eigenvalue. Um, and if I plug in the indicator uh, vector, for any subset of my graph. And I want to look at its Rayleigh quotient. Well, I need to project away uh, from the all ones vector. So I do that. Uh, and this pretty uh, elementary calculation will show that, in fact, uh, if I plug in this indicator uh, vector and I project away, I'm going to get some relation to my isoparametry. So there's some relation between the Rayleigh quotient, which uh, is related to the spectrum, and the isoparametry of a graph or of a subset. So this is going to be my continuous relaxation of my problem of finding a small subset. Uh, and one should note that because the uh, Rayleigh quotients uh, minimize uh, to get us the second eigenvalue, uh, we're immediately going to get this bound, that the isoparametry of the graph is bounded above or below by some multiple of the second eigenvalue. OK. So like I said, uh, if we're going to think of this as a relaxation problem, then um, I started off with the problem of trying to minimize the uh, isoparametric uh, ratio of a subset, trying to find the, the a subset that minimizes this quantity. And uh, we could think of relaxing this now, since we know that the Rayleigh quotients are, um, the Rayleigh quotients are related to the isoparametric ratio. We can think of relaxing this now to the following pro problem. We have uh, vectors y, which are indexed by our vertices. We're looking at ones that are perpendicular to our lowest eigenspace. We're trying to minimize the Rayleigh quotient. But in order for any relaxation problem to succeed, once we solve our relaxation problem, which in this case is very easy to solve, um, we need a method of rounding vectors. So namely, if we have a y, <coughs> if we have a y which has a really small Rayleigh quotient, we need some way to get a subset out of that which has a really small isoparametry. OK, and so uh, this is where Cheeger's inequality comes from. So let's talk about this. So this is like probably the first nice theorem in spectral graph theory, if you take a formal course on it. So given uh, any vector y, um, which is perpendicular to our lowest eigenspace, we can uh, form a subset of vertices in our graph such that the isoparametry of the isoparametric ratio of that subset is uh, bounded above by uh, some function, some nice function of the Rayleigh quotient. Um, and it's interesting how we form those subsets. Uh, we form those subsets. The subsets are guaranteed to be of some form where 
if we order all the entries of y and we form subsets by taking uh, by picking some threshold and only taking vertices which have values below that threshold, we're going to get a, a whole family of subsets. Uh, and the way this is proved is you put some distribution on that uh, collection of subsets, and you look at the expectation of the isoparametric ratio, and you show that it's bounded above. So therefore, it's one of these subsets, uh, one of these threshold subsets, is going to give us small uh, isoparametric ratio. Uh, notice that if we then uh, minimize over all uh, subsets and all y, we're going to get um, that the isoparametric uh, number of the graph, isoparametry number of the graph, is going to be bounded by the second eigenvalue. So in total, uh, if we're looking at this from a spectrum point of view, we can conclude that the second to lowest eigenvalue uh, is directly related to the isoparametry of a graph. OK, and then there's a bunch of caveats here, uh, things I've swept under the rug. So uh, for irregular graphs g, uh, people don't look at the Laplacian, and people don't look at the isoparametry. They look at a thing called conductance, and they look at a thing called the normalized Laplacian. So the statement is usually um, stated in terms of those two. But when we're looking at regular graphs, those are just uh, fixed multiples of uh, the two quantities I've listed. Okay. So this immediately gives us an algorithm. So the way that this theorem is proved is through an algorithm, basically. So uh, we want to find a set with really small isoparametry. So what do we do? We uh, take, we want a y, which has a really low Rayleigh quotient. Uh, well, we know the y with the smallest Rayleigh quotient is the second eigenvector by Courant Fisher. So we take the second eigenvector, we order the entries, and we start to look at uh, the subsets form by picking a threshold. Um, so subsets of this form. And we're guaranteed one of these subsets is going to be nice. One of these subsets is going to have isoparametric ratio bounded by this function of lambda 2. So how should we imagine this? We should imagine this as an embedding of our graph into R, into just the line, uh, where for every vertex we're uh, picking the, uh, the, the coordinate, its appropriate coordinate of the second eigenvector. And then we're just picking some point to split the line. And the vertices on the left hand side of our split will be uh, on one, one of our subsets, and the vertices on the right hand will be on the other subset. So if we apply that to this example, We'll see, that's exactly what happened. So, I mean, I picked this really nice graph, but this works in general, this phenomena. So I take this graph, I look at the second eigenvector. Um, so three of the vertices uh, have weight one under the second eigenvector. Three of the vertices have weight negative one on the, uh, the second eigenvector. And so when I think of this as an embedding into R, uh, three of the vertices map to negative one, three of the vertices map to one, and I have to pick some thresholding spot, which here is, there's only one choice. Uh, in which everything to the left will be on one of my clusters and everything to the right will be on one of my clusters. And we see here it gets what we know to be the optimal clustering. Okay, so that's a crash course in Shiger's inequality. Um, so, summary, uh, you know, there's, there's obviously this is just the beginning of the rabbit hole. There's a lot of natural quantities which can be associated to the spectra of graphs. Um, and Chigurh's inequality is a way of relating uh, properties like uh, isoparametry to the spectrum of the graph. There's a bunch of questions, of course, about uh, extremality, existence of extremal objects, et cetera. Uh, and then there is a way to do this more generally for k-clustering. So for k-clustering, uh, from the point of view of that last slide, one might ask, what happens if I um, take the first k non-trivial eigenvectors, and I take the coordinates of a vector of a verte vertex to be the coordinates of the first k non-trivial eigenvectors, then I end up with an embedding into Rk. And can I use that embedding into Rk to help me uh, efficiently cluster the graph? The answer is yes. Um, but there's more to be said there. Okay. Are there any questions? 